the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. Are you guys ready to get into the word of the Lord this evening? Praise God. Uh, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and get down on my knees. I'm going to go before the Lord in prayer. If you're able to join me in prayer and honoring the Lord, would you stand as we go before the Lord in prayer? Father God, we come before you in this place tonight. Lord, we're just grateful that we have the opportunity to come into the house of the Lord. Lord, we don't come into this place to hear from a man, to hear from a woman, or to hear from a band. But Lord, we come into this place to hear from you. And we fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this church. Father, we thank you that you would open our eyes to see and our ears to hear the word that you would have us to hear today. Father, that you would, uh, the seed of the word of God would fall onto good ground in our hearts. Father, that we would leave this place impacted, uh, moved, and ready to go and to do what you have called us to do. To go out to the highways and the byways and teach and make disciples of Jesus Christ. And we thank you that we are all full-time ministers of your gospel, Father. It's not just one person on a pulpit, Father, but it's your church. And Lord, we also lift up the churches all across the Inland Empire and all over the world that are bringing your glory and your presence today, Father, and celebrating in your word. And Lord, we just ask that your presence would be amongst them as well. And we give you the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said, Amen. 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 Well, praise God. If you got your Bibles with me, turn with me to the book of 1 Peter. I've got a fun message, I think, tonight. I've got a special night for you tonight, too. I'm going to tell you right now, but then I'll announce it afterwards as well. Tonight is a, we have, it's called a Connect Night, where after service, uh, hosted by our singles ministry tonight, I mean, we got, it's a, it's a good night. So we got ice cream and fudge bars out there for you tonight just to, you know, to, to mingle, to meet, to say hi to somebody and grab an ice. I mean, what better day for ice cream? Then today, hallelujah. Well, hey, if you got your Bible, turn with me to the book of 1 Peter. And tonight, if you're taking, if you're taking notes, the title of tonight's message that I've given it, that I've given it is, is I've got the joy. Now, I wanted to name it, I've got the joy, 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 <laughs> down in my heart. But because I work with the video department, because I work with the web department, because I work with the audio department, I know that when you have long titles, it takes a lot of effort to get that on the web. And when somebody tries to access it, it goes into the, that little, you know, three dots because you can't read the whole title. So I figured I'll just abbreviate it tonight. So I've got the joy. But you guys remember that song maybe as a, as a kid. If you have kids, maybe you're, you sing that song to your kids. You know, I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. There we go. Tonight I want to talk to you about the subject of joy. And it's a subject that it, it's close and, and near and dear to my heart because I think that it applies to each and every one of us in our stages of life. And, and we have decisions to make each and every day how we're going to operate, how we're going to respond, how we're going to live our lives, how we're going to act, whether or not we're going to act based on our circumstances, based on our feelings, or based on what the Word of God tells us that we should act and the Word of God speaks over you and I. And so I think it's a, it's a great subject. So here we are in the, in, the, in the book of 1 Peter. And in the first chapter, I want to read to you out of the sixth verse. Here Peter writes, he says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Right off the bat we see, hey man, that's just life in general. Now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved. Grieved is a serious word. That's not just, ah, you have been, you know, irritated by some various trials. That isn't just that, you know, you, you have been, you know, uh, somebody's been poking you, some, you know, the guy behind you has been bumping your seat, you know, a, a, in church, and, and you've been grieved by that. No, I mean, being grieved by various trials means that you have been afflicted. You have experienced some hardships in your life. And so he says, you take joy in, 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 in this you greatly rejoice that now for a little while, you have, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may, found, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So here Peter goes on to say, he says, listen, it's all right. He says, rejoice in the fact that you go through hard times. Because if you were in, if you were in, the, in, in church this weekend, you heard Pastor Jim talking about a trial and, and, and how the, you know, we, have, we can invest on the foundation that is laid by Jesus Christ, gold, silver, and precious stones, or wood, hay, and straw. And the gold, silver, and precious stones, when they are tested by fire, will, found, uh, will be found to be made pure, but the wood, hay, and the straw will be burned up. And he says that you're, the testing of your faith through the hardships of your life may be proven that, you know, through fire as we read here. 
that you may find to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Verse number 8, whom having not seen, or uh, some translations say, whom, whom you don't know, yet you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believe, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Receiving, verse number 9, the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. I love what he says in verse number 8 there. He says... Now, though you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Now, we're talking about joy, and I love what Peter says here, and I love the description that he says, because he doesn't just say, now in believing him, you rejoice with joy and full of glory. Because we would understand that. We could get that. Praise God, I rejoice and I'm happy and I've got a good attitude and I'm, I've got the, you know, the joy of the Lord in my heart and I'm, I'm going, I'm going. But no, he adds a descriptive statement to the end of that word, that little three-letter word, joy. And he says, joy inexpressible. In our lifetimes, we experience joy. You know, we have good times. Maybe good memories with family where we, we laughed until we cried or we had good times in our, in our lives or, or you know, good, uh, good times of, in our businesses where, hey, man, things were great and there's a smile on our face. We know what joy is. Even if you've had a down and a dismal life all of your life, you can experience that there have been moments in your life of joy, but they haven't been joy inexpressible, a joy in so much, uh, in such a way that you can't even describe it. That it can't be, you, that words don't do justice to it. And yet here Peter says to us that in believing in him, that we may rejoice with joy that we can't describe. With a joy that words don't do justice for. So it's not just about walking with a smile on our face. Joy is not just about, you know, uh, having a, a big grin and saying, God bless you. But rather, joy comes from on the inside. Joy inexpressible is something that we live, that we operate in. And you know, we have a decision. What we can put stock in as far as our lives. Hey, we're Americans. Our, I was just thinking about this the other day. You know, our nation allows us the right to write off entertainment on our taxes. You can write off certain things as entertainment value. So the, 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 the thought behind that is, is that we are a nation, we are a culture, we are a people that pursue joy. And everything that we try to do, we try to get joy out of. So you have a decision what you can put stock into for your joy. You can put stock, uh, uh, your, your stock and joy into possessions, into business, into money. If you're a man, you can put uh, uh, joy into, into women. If you're a woman, you can put the joy of your life into having an identity through some man. You can put uh, a joy into your relationships with your friends or what have you. Or you can put your, your stock of your joy into God. And you know what the thing about money is? You spend it. And not always do you spend money as fast as you earn it. Sometimes you spend money faster than you earn it, and so sometimes money dries up. You put your stock of joy into possessions. You know what? Let's say it's, 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 your, it's your material things. It's the car you drive. It's the image that you maintain. Well, I'll tell you what. The tires on that car wear out. The paint job on that car, once you start washing it, it starts to get a little bit more dull. And as time goes by, that's a depreciating asset. You put your stock of your joy into relationships, into friendships. I'll tell you what. I mean, no, sometimes those friends turn their back on you for whatever reason. If you're a man, put your stock into women. They leave you. If you're a girl, you put your stock into men. Tell you what, they disappear. You say, Pastor Luke, I'm married. I, I, I have a hap I'm happily married to my wife, man. I got joy in that. Let me tell you something. The law of nature, one of you is going to die. So it's just natural for that to happen. So when you put joy into things that are temporal, things that are material, things that exist today, guess what? You're bound to lose it. But when you put the joy in your heart, when you put the joy of your life, when you put your life, your attention, your eyes onto the joy of God, let me tell you something. That's a joy that doesn't end. That's a joy that doesn't dry up. That's a joy that isn't limited by circumstance. That's a joy that isn't limited by what the money in your bank account says, by what the people affirm in your relationship say or do. It's an eternal joy. So we have a decision each and every day what we can put our stock in. So we know, yes, we can, we can look to God for joy, absolutely. Yes, we can look to man for joy. We can look to possessions for joy, absolutely. But tonight, I want to look at where does joy come from? 
especially looking to God, especially looking in our relationships with God, where does the joy come from? And there could be, you know, 40 different points of what we have from where joy comes from. We can look at all the different areas of joy, but I've got three simple things for you today and then some, some short application at the end of the message. So tonight, let's take a look at where joy comes from. Number one, joy comes from the presence of God. Joy comes from the presence of God. You know, when you are in the presence of God, all sorts of emotions, all sorts of feelings come to light. God has a way of speaking to the inner man of each and every one of us. That when we get into the, to the, to the, uh, the times of presence, hey man, I've been in, in the places where the presence of God w- swept through the place so much that everybody was just sobbing because of the presence of God. But even though there was tears, even though there was, there was uh, 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 emotions in that, you know, at the end of those tears was joy. Maybe in the presence of God there was fear, there was a humbling. But at the end of that experience, as you walked away, there was a joy because you were fulfilled in what you did and you were fulfilled in dwelling in the presence of God. There is joy in the presence of God. Let me show you what the scriptures say. In Psalms, the 16th chapter, if you've got your Bibles, let's just turn there together. In Psalms, the 16th chapter... It's a psalm of David known as a golden psalm. Here as he writes, I'm going to read verse number 9. I'll put you verse number 11 up on the overhead. Therefore my heart is glad, Psalm 16, verse 9, my, and my glory rejoices. My flesh will also rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol, uh, a place of, of, uh, uh, where, where the dead go. Nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Speaking forward to the Messiah. Verse number 11. You will show me the path of life. And in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So here the psalmist David writes and he says, God, I I take glory, I take fulfillment in you. Why? Because in your presence is fullness of joy. Now you know what? Just like what Peter said earlier about joy indescribable, I love how David also writes that he doesn't just go and say, in your presence is joy. But rather, he gives it a descriptive statement and he says, in your presence is fullness of joy. Because we can find joy. Hey, we've all had good moments where we've laughed and man, that was, man, that was a good day. We've had memories where we can recall back and say, wow, we, I just had a great time. And that, that, even when I think back to it, I think of my son right now and it brings joy to my heart. But that's joy. In the presence of God, he gives us a, a, us a descriptive statement. And in the presence of God, we see that there is fullness of joy. We may experience joy in our life, but I'll tell you what, without the very presence of God in our lives, without being in the very presence of God, we don't know what fullness of joy is. We may have a glimpse of what life has to offer through our moments and through the good and the bad, but when we live and when we dwell and when we abide in the, fu- in the presence of God, I'll tell you what, that's where the fullness of joy is. And that's where the real joy is. Love it. I always quote the scripture, especially when I pray, especially before church and Psalms. It says, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. Why? Because that's where the presence of God dwells. So when even when you come into the house of the Lord, when you come into church, I'll tell you what, it's tough for me, especially, man, I got on the young adults on Friday about this. It's tough for me as a pastor to see people as they come into church to stand, especially during a praise and worship song when we're singing about how great our God is, to stand there with a sour puss face. And, mm, because why? In the presence of God, in the house of God is his presence. And where his presence is, there's the fullness of joy. And if there's anywhere that we should shout and sing and be excited and be joyous for God, it should be in the house of God where his presence is. So when we come to church, we should shed what we have and shed our ideals of what joy is and and forget about the things that try to rob our joy on the way here. Driving down Redlands Boulevard, Boulevard, somebody cuts you off right there at the Southside Saloon to turn into the parking lot. 
They're trying to rob your joy. But your joy doesn't come from driving. Your joy comes from being in the presence of God because that's where the fullness of joy is. In Romans, I'll just go ahead and put this up on the overhead. In Romans, the 14th chapter, Paul the Apostle is writing. He's talking about don't let the, 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 your, your good works be counted as evil because of, of eating or, or, or of drinking something that might offend somebody. But then in the 14th chapter, in the verse 17, he says, For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. In the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you something. When you are in the Spirit, when you are living and you have the Spirit of God inside of you, it doesn't matter what the outside says. It doesn't matter what the inside says. It doesn't matter what the emotions say. It doesn't matter what the external says. It doesn't matter what the bank account says. It doesn't matter what your relationships say because you've got the Spirit of God living inside of you. And the, and the, and the joy of God, the righteousness of God, the kingdom of God is not in eating and drinking the things that we do on the outside, but it is inside in the dwelling of the presence of God. And he's given us his helper, the Holy Spirit, to dwell with us, to be with us, to remind us, to, to bring those things to our remembrance. What are those things that we should remember? That we should have joy in our God, not in our circumstances. To understand that joy comes from the presence of God. We're talking about joy and where joy comes from. Praise God. Number two, joy comes from abiding in Christ. Abiding in Christ. Abiding, living, dwelling, growing in Christ. Joy comes, we see, from the presence of God. When you are in the presence of God, when you come into the presence of God, when you usher in the presence of God through your worship and through your prayers, there's joy. But joy also comes from living, from breathing, from growing, from being connected to Jesus Christ. Joy comes from abiding. And in John, the 15th chapter, if you guys will turn with me to John, the 15th chapter, let me give you a little bit of background. I tell you, I use this, this chapter and, and so many of my messages. Why? Because this chapter has changed my life. This chapter is probably one of the best chapters to read. If you just want to pick up a chapter of the Bible and just pick up something and read and you don't know where to go, go to John 15. But here Jesus Christ is speaking about being the vine, using the illustration of being the vine. We being the branches. And he says, abide in me and I in you. Live in me and let me live in you. Be connected in me as one. And he says, and you would bear much fruit is our calling, is our goal. As a member of the vine, it's our evidence. We've talked about this before. This is not a new concept. I've said this several times. That fruit is the evidence of that plant. A, a, a grapevine will bear grapes. It can't bear watermelons because that's not its DNA. That's not its inside. It's, it's grapes. And so Jesus Christ says, if you abide in me and I in you, you bear much fruit. That fruit reflects Jesus Christ in our lives. So first and foremost, you want to look at your life. Where is your fruit coming from? What is the fruit of your life? Are you lacking joy? Are you missing out on the joy of God? Then to look at the fruit, because Jesus says, when you abide in the vine, you'll bear much fruit. And God will make it so that you bear fruit by pruning. Amen. And we should take joy in that. And he goes on to say that because of you bearing fruit, you can ask of God and receive. And it pleases God. And it glorifies God. And then Jesus Christ goes on to say in John, the 15th chapter, these things I have spoken to you. That my joy may remain in you. That your joy may be full. Two joys right here. He says two joys in this statement. He says all of these things, if you abide in me and I in you, and you all these things that I have said, I have said these so that my joy, speaking of, of God's joy, the joy of the Lord, be in you and your joy be full. Because we can be empty in our joy. We can be half full in our joy. We can be three quarters in our joy. We could be running on quarter tank of joy. And you know, yeah, I, it's enough for me to give you a smile. <laughs> I'm all right. Got a little bit. But he says, no. 
Because my joy is in you, your joy is full. So see, Jesus knows. He was smart. We're talking about God here. He knows the condition of man. He knows the lives of man, and he knows that we are fickle people. And that the circumstances of our lives, the things around us, affect our vision and affect our decisions and our emotions. And so he says, my joy would be in you. Because if it was, if it was, if it was reliant upon you and I, we'd be up and down like a roller coaster. But he says, when you abide in me, when you live, when you breathe, when you grow, when you eat from the vine, when you are a part wholly of the vine and you begin to bear fruit of the vine, the evidence of what you are, my joy, the joy of God will come through you and bleed out of you and be evidence of you so that your joy would be full. So then you can see that clearly, we see that when we abide in Christ, it doesn't matter what happens on the outside. Because his joy is in us. Jesus Christ's joy is the gasoline for our tanks of our lives. And each and every day, we can fill up. And it's free. The price doesn't go up. So when you go to the gas station and your joy is running on empty, especially over that Memorial Day weekend, you can know that the tank of your joy is full. Because Jesus Christ is in you. And all you got to do is tap into that resource that Jesus Christ said, abide in me, live and grow and breathe in me, and your joy will be full. You know what? I love what it says. We know this. It's a very popular verse. In uh, Galatians, in the fifth chapter, 22nd, 23rd verse, here Paul the Apostle is writing, and he gives us the works of the flesh, tells us what the, the state of mankind is, and we can see clearly that it's envy, it's, it's, it's selfishness, it's, 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 it's our own desires. But then he goes on to say in contrast, but, verse number 22, but the fruit of the Spirit. Remember we just talked about fruit is the evidence, it's the external. Fruit is, you bear fruit when you are connected. A tree that is not connected, a tree that is not healthy. I've used this example before. I have this orange tree, I have yet to kill it. But I have this orange tree that is, I planted in my backyard, what, six years ago. I've never gotten an orange out of this tree. This tree is not healthy. I've pruned it. I've fertilized it. But you know what? I'm not a botanist. I'm not a gardener. I don't want your opinions. I don't want your advice. I don't care. The tree's gone. But that tree shows fruit, even though it doesn't have fruit. The fact that the tree doesn't have fruit shows that it's not healthy. But if the tree has big, oh, juicy, luscious oranges and those, those blossoms just, oh, man, they just fill the fragrance of the air, you know, oh, man, that tree's good. That's going to be a good orange. I could squeeze that and make some fresh juice. Oh, because the sign of health. So the fruit of our flesh is envious, is, is deceits, is, is unhappiness, is, is our own lustful desires. But then in contrast, the fruit of the Spirit, the evidence of the Spirit of, of, of abiding in Jesus Christ is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, continuing on. But the fruit, the evidence of our existing, the evidence of us abiding in the vine should be that we have joy. We just talked about loving people, the first fruit of the Spirit, of loving God and loving people. Now we're moving on to the second one, and that is to have joy. So why is it that we as Christians sometimes are sourpuss, are ugh, sucking on lemons? doesn't matter what the situation is. It doesn't matter what the politicians say. It doesn't matter what the, 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 the economy says. You and I have something that everybody doesn't, and we need to reflect that to the world. Because let me tell you something. That is what is infectious. It's the joy of God when we abide and when we dwell in Jesus Christ. And it's time for us, the church, the body of Christ, to reflect the joy of God. Yeah, Amen? We're talking about where joy comes from. Number three tonight, final point for this evening, where joy comes from is sharing God's love. We get joy from sharing God's love. You know, it's an awkward thing sometimes when we speak to somebody. When God says, tell them about me, and you're like, 
I don't want to offend them. I don't want to turn them off. I don't want them to think I'm a weirdo. But when we step out, we shed ourselves of our opinions and we shed ourselves of our selfish desires and what our, our self-image is and we are faithful and obedient to do what God has asked us to do. And we act as though Jesus has spoken over us that we are the light of the world, that we might shine God's glory for all to see and people begin to see it. Joy comes from that. Why? Because fulfillment comes from that. You know, I've got this, uh, I, I used to, a couple of years ago, I played on a, on a hockey team. And, and, and my brother-in-law got me into playing on it. And we were playing ice hockey with this recreational league. And, you know, everybody, I mean, hockey and especially the recreational league, I think, I think that the, the unofficial term for those leagues is they're called like beer leagues or something like that because it's a bunch of younger guys. Some of them actually, it's a bunch of all types of guys and girls. And, you know, they play a game and they all go get smashed after the game. Well, everybody began to know that I had something different about me. They would always bring a big old locker or a big old case of beers and drinks. And every time they'd say, hey, you want, you want one? No, no, no. And after a while, I began to, uh, they gave me the nickname, the Rev. You know, they began to call me Rev. And, and I was sharing with some of my friends that I had made on that team. You know, they knew where I was. They knew that I was a pastor on the staff at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. They knew that I invited them to my young adult services and things of that nature. And I remember I went camping with my brother-in-law and with a friend. And I remember we were all sitting around the campfire, and, and one of the guys that was, uh, was, was on the team, you know, he began to just kind of prod and ask questions about, well, what does the Bible say about that? What does the Bible say about this? And, 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 you know, all of a sudden it just came out of me, and I just started going through the altar call. And I said, hey, man, you know what? Let me just say, you know, if you were to, go to, if you were to die tonight, you know, and I went through the whole thing. And, you know, he didn't respond at that moment. And I was kind of like, man, you know, all right, at least I planted the seed. You know what's interesting? It was about six months later, I got a text from him. And he says, hey, man, you know, he lives, he lives in the other side of the, of the valley on the riverside area. And he says, hey, man, I just want to let you know I attended this church. And I just couldn't stop crying. And he said, the spirit of God just came on me. And I just couldn't stop crying. And there was something about God in there. And I just had to just get more and more of it. And he said, I'm just going to that church. And I just, I just wanted to let you know because I'd stopped playing hockey. And you know what? The joy of the Lord rose up inside of me. I don't know at this point whether he's there or not, but you know what? The fact that I shared the love of God with somebody and I saw that the seed was planted and I saw that his life had been changed and that he had seen the light of God, hey, that's called fulfillment. That's joy. When we step out about ourselves, why do you think we have the shout? This year, why is it that every week you get a new shout of somebody, of something that God has done? Because it builds us up. It brings the joy of God to say, hey, God has touched somebody. God has done something over here. God has done something over here. And to know that our God is faithful. Like, the song, like a popular culture song says, our God is not dead, but he is alive. And in sharing the love of God, we have joy in our lives. I love the, the, the book of Acts. In Acts, the 15th chapter. Acts, the 15th chapter. Paul is on his way to Jerusalem to, to join in a council of deciding whether or not Gentiles, people who were not Jewish, should participate in Jewish customs in order to be saved. And... So here they are, Paul and Barnabas, and they're going about. And an interesting thing talking about joy is we're in Acts the 15th chapter. In Acts the 14th chapter, Paul is stoned. You want to talk about having your joy be removed from you? How about, how about being stoned and left for dead, yet still alive? Yet Paul still has joy. Paul still has zeal. Paul, he's been beaten. He's been kicked, kicked around. How many times in our life have we felt like we've been kicked while we've been down? How we've, how we've been beaten up by the world and the circumstances around us? Yet, Paul continued to share, and it says in Acts the 15th chapter. Verse number 3, so being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the brethren. 
and the fact that they were passing through church on their way to Jerusalem, on their way to a council, and they were saying, hey, you won't believe what God is doing in the lives of the outsiders. You won't believe. You, I mean, you couldn't even believe what God is doing in the lives of the Gentiles. People began to become excited. Why? Because they knew that the word of God was being spread, that the God that they served, the God that they believed in, was getting imparted and touched into the lives of the people, and it built joy and it built momentum in the church. The joy of the Lord comes from sharing the gospel. In Philippians, the fourth chapter, I'll just go and throw this up on the overhead. Paul again is writing. and He's, he's concluding. And in the fourth, fourth verse of the fourth chapter, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Starts with a, a, with a, a positive attitude. He says, listen, let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. I'm sorry, did I tell you to go to Philippians? Wait, we'll get there in a minute. I said Philippians, I meant to go to 1 Thessalonians. Guys, I'll put that up on the overhead. 1 Thessalonians. In the second chapter, he says, But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart. This meaning I can't be with you, but I'm there with you in heart have endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. Therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan had hindered us. And Paul goes on to say about them, describing the people that he's writing to. Goes on in verse number 19, and he says, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? And then he goes on to say, Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? And then verse number 20 says, For you are our glory and our joy. Paul is writing to the people that he had taught, the people that he had shared the word of God with. And he says, Listen, you being the disciples of myself, being the disciples of Jesus Christ that I have taught, I have longed to be with you, but I can't but understand that because I have shared the glory, you are the apple of my eye. You are the joy of my heart. Because when we share God, we fulfill the plan of the kingdom. If you recall in Matthew, Jesus gave us this little term at the end of the book of Matthew called the Great Commission. To go to all the world to preach and, and make disciples, baptizing every, every nation. It is our destiny. It is our calling. There is a fulfillment inside of us. We have been wired by God on the inside not to stay silent. You guys understand what I just said? Although our personalities may be the type where we don't like to talk, it may be hard for us to branch out. It may be hard for us to reach out. On the inside, by God, through God, we have been wired. We have been designed. To speak and to teach and to share the love of God to all those around us. And when we do, we have fulfillment in our lives because we are operating in the design that God has given us. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? Jesus Christ said that we don't praise him that the rocks would cry out. The primary function of our mouth is not to communicate with each other but to communicate and to share God to those around all of us that we might spread and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ that all might be saved, that the lost may be found and live in fulfillment of our lives. Amen. So tonight we talked about where joy comes. Like I said, there could be 40 things from where joy comes from. Joy comes from the presence of God. Where can you find the presence of God? You wanted to find the presence of God? Get in church. Say, man, I can't get the presence of God in my house. There's too many things going on. Why do you think we have 10 services a week? Because we want to wear ourselves out? No. We want you here in the presence of God to learn, to grow, to expand in your life. Pastor Jim's always said it. You want to come to church once a week? Fine, great. You might maintain your relationship. Twice a week, you'll start to grow. Three times a week, man, you're going to explode. Why? Because you're in the presence of God. There's joy in your life. Joy comes from abiding in Christ. To live, to breathe, to dwell, to grow in Christ. Joy comes from sharing in God's love. But I can't leave you at where joy comes from. Because listen, we all go through seasons. And there are times of good and there are times 
of bad. We all know them. We call them the, the storms of life. And how do we maintain joy when our hearts are broken? How do we maintain joy when everything around us is collapsing? Well, I love it. What the Bible tells us in the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah, the eighth chapter. I'll just give you a little bit of background here. Nehemiah, the eighth chapter here. And Nehemiah is a, is a man, he's a cupbearer to the king, of, uh, 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 the king and he, he found out that this is in a time when Jerusalem or, or the, the, the Hebrews, the Israel has been taken into captivity. And he finds that his home city of, of Jerusalem has been destroyed. The walls have been torn down. And he's grieved by the condition of his people being scattered. And he goes to the king and petitions the king that he might have permission to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the walls and reestablish the covenant and, 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 and the ways of God. And the king grants him, the God puts it upon the king's heart, and the king grants him permission. And Nehemiah goes and builds these walls, and he has opposition from the outside. He has opposition from the inside, from all around. Yet in some 50 days, Nehemiah completes this great task. Now, these aren't walls like cinder block walls. You know, like Nehemiah's got a couple mortar bricklayers, and they're just putting up cinder blocks. I mean, these are walls to survive bombardment. Some, some, in some places, up to 30 feet thick, and they rebuild the walls around the city. So now they've rebuilt the walls, and now the prophet is reading the, the, the law back to the people. And as the prophet begins to read the law of God back to the people, they begin to mourn and they begin to weep because the law was designed to show men that they need God. The law, Paul the Apostle tells us that the law shows us of our sin, that we would be ignorant of our sin. But when the law is read and we hear about what we should and should not do according to God in the law of the Old Testament, we have been we are made aware and they have been made aware of their wrongdoings. And the people begin to mourn and they begin to cry. Nehemiah says to them, verse number 9, Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe and the Levites who taught the people said all to the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way. Eat the fat. Drink the sweet. Send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Here the people are brought down. Listen, we as people have a tendency, our administrator Fred Adams always likes to call, call it, we like to navel gaze. Let me demonstrate navel gazing to you. We stare at our belly buttons, not literally, but emotionally our attention is drawn upon ourselves. And our joy can be sapped, our joy can be sucked out of that when we look upon our situations, when we look upon the things that are going around us. But when we keep our eyes fixed on God, like Nehemiah said, let the joy of the Lord be your strength. Not let the joy of your present circumstances, not let the joy that we're celebrating Jerusalem being rebuilt. No, let the joy of the Lord be your strength, he says. It's like Peter as he stepped out of the boat. And he walked on water. How does that relate to joy? Because the intent that Jesus Christ had when Peter came out onto the water was for Peter to come to Jesus and to walk on water and to meet Jesus on the water. But Peter lost his eyes. He lost his focus. He began to look at the circumstances around him. And he began to sink in the water and Jesus Christ pulled him back up. It's the same thing with the joy in our lives, guys. We can focus on Jesus Christ but when we start pulling our eyes off to everything else and we start looking at all the different things and we start to focus our joy on what our money, what our money says, what our possessions say, what our clothes say, what our, what our status says, what our friends say about us, what our family says about us, we get so distracted with the things and the waves around us that we begin to sink in the life that we have. But the joy of the Lord, when we focus and we fix our attention upon God and God alone, we can rest assured that the joy of God sustains us, keeps us, maintains us. And like Jesus Christ with Peter, who pulled himself, pulled him up out of the water, can pull us out of our muck and our mire. And we can have joy, like Peter said, inexpressible. That people might look at us and actually wonder what it is about us like Jesus told us that we are that light, that they might say, there's something about you I can't quite put my finger on. What is it about you? Let me tell you what it is. Rather than to blend in, to be 
ever, be just like everybody around us. And in conclusion, that verse that I was reading earlier, Philippians in the fourth chapter, Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let, the gentleness, let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. A peace that surpasses understanding. See, our understanding says joy cannot exist when we are heartbroken. But the peace of God that surpasses our understanding says, hey man, why are you smiling when your life is such a wreck? Why are you smiling when your bank account says this? Why are you smiling when your situation looks unde un 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 unattainable? Why are you smiling when you're sick and battling that disease? Why are you happy? Because I have peace from God that surpasses all understanding. And because of that, I have the joy of God in my life. And I rely on that to be my strength. That to fill my tank up rather than the things of this world. The joy of the Lord is in each and every one of us. In his presence. In abiding in Jesus Christ. And in sharing the love of God. Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord tonight? <laughs> praise God. Well, praise God. Hey, listen, you don't want to miss out. Grab a shout on the way out. You know, I want to read that. You want to grab a hold of what God has done in the lives of people. I want to remind you, right after service, we got ice cream and we got fudge bars. So grab a hold of one of those. Meet somebody. Don't just grab one and run. Hey, I found the secret to not getting you guys to leave early. It's to offer you ice cream after service so you stick around and wait for it. So grab a hold of that. Put on by the singles ministry. Meet somebody out there. You say, hey, Pastor, I'm not, I'm not single. It's only hosted by the singles. You don't have to be single to get ice cream. But that's our singles saying, hey, we want to love you, the church, uh, the, church uh, the church, body. So grab a hold of an ice cream or a fudge bar. Grab your kids before you get that. Bring them out with you in the courtyard. It's a beautiful night, a beautiful afternoon. So you don't want to miss out on that. And hey, listen, also don't forget in two Sundays, right? It's two Sundays. Not this next Sunday, the Sunday after. Martha Munizzi. Bring somebody out. Free concert. Man, it's going to be amazing. I'll tell you what, she is all over the world. She's written so many songs, so, songs that you don't know. When you hear them, you're going to be like, oh, my gosh, she wrote that? Yes, she did. So you don't want to miss out on that. And remember, ladies, June 7th, don't miss out on Girlfriends PM. Girlfriends is our women's Bible study. So for all of those, you, all you ladies, Thursday, June 7th, don't miss out on that. Hey, listen, I want to do one more thing tonight before we dismiss. I want to ask you a question. I want you to examine yourself. You know, it would be, be an atrocity for us to have a service, to enjoy hearing the word of God, to talk about the, the joy of the Lord, to hear some music, to have ice cream and fudge bars, but not give you the opportunity to, to examine whether or not if you were going to go to heaven or you were going to go to hell. It's a simple question I want to ask you. Examine it within your own heart. Nobody will know the answer but you and God. If you were to leave this place tonight and you were to die, would you find yourself in heaven or would you find yourself in hell? It's a relatively simple question, but why don't we go over some of those answers that you may have had? You know, you might say, well, Pastor Luke, you know, I, I'm not sure that, that heaven exists or I'm not sure that hell exists. Well, you know, let me tell you this. Just because you don't know or you're not sure because you don't think that hell is a real place doesn't mean it's not real. That's like saying, I don't believe in semi-trucks, maybe because I grew up in a place where I had never seen a semi-truck in my life. So I didn't believe that they existed. And I can go and stand in the slow lane of the freeway. And lo and behold, I meet one face to face. Just because you can't see it, you don't, you don't know about it, doesn't mean it's not real. Hell is a very real place. It was important enough for God to mention it in his word. It was important for Jesus Christ to tell us about it. It's important for enough for you and I to take it serious and to quit playing games. You know, you might say, well, Pastor Luke, you know, I, 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 I'm a good person. You know, I don't, I don't cheat on my taxes. I, 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 I don't drive over the speed limit. I've never robbed a 7-Eleven. I've even given to charitable organizations. I donated to the Red Cross. Doesn't that mean that I'm going to get into heaven? Can you show me where it says in the word of God that because of your good deeds that you're going to find your way into heaven? That because you've never robbed a 7-Eleven because you don't cheat on your taxes because you've even given to humanitarian efforts that you're going to get into the, to heaven. Can you show me where it says that? Nowhere in the word of God will you find that. You know, as a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that our good deeds according to God are like filthy rags. Nothing you and I could ever do on our own would ever make us good enough to get into the kingdom of God, to get into heaven. It's just not that way. Well, but Pastor Luke, I think I'd get to heaven. I sure hope so. 
Can you show me in the Bible where it says because you think that you're going to get to heaven? Because you hope that you're going to get to heaven? Because you earnestly desire to find yourself there at the end of your life? That you're going to get in heaven? Can you show me in the Bible where it says that? Like you have the most positive outlook on life? That you're going to get your way in heaven? Nowhere in the word of God will you find that. Well, but, but Pastor Luke, you know, I, I wasn't raised as a Hindu or as a Buddhist or as a Muslim. Any other philosophical thought or world religion? So doesn't that mean that kind of by default that I, I'm going to get myself into heaven? Can you show me where it says that because you weren't raised as a Buddhist, as a Hindu, as a Muslim, or any other type of philosophical thought that you're going to get your way into heaven? Can you show me in the Bible, in the Word of God, where it says that? No, where will you find that? Well, but, but Pastor Luke, you know, I, I, I believe that, you know, there's an existence after, after life, you know, that when I die, I'm going to go somewhere, but I, I just can't quite say that it's this or it's that. Can you show me where it says it because you have a general belief? Because somebody told you that if you die that, you know, you're going to go to heaven somewhere. Or you're going to have this existence or this reincarnation. Whatever it may be that you believe that you're going to find that way. That you're going to put your stock in that. Nowhere in the Bible will you find that. Just because you think or you believe or because you think that, yeah, there might be something there for me. There may not. You're going to get your way into heaven. It's just not that way, guys. Love you enough. I respect you enough. I honor you enough tonight to tell you the truth. You know, you might say, well, Pastor Luke, you know. I know who God is. I know about Moses and Jonah and Abraham and Jesus. Doesn't that mean I'm going to get into heaven? Can you show me in the word of God where it says because you know the stories of the Bible? Because you know who Moses, Jonah, who Abraham and Jesus are? Because you know who God is that you're going to get into heaven? The Bible says that the demons in hell know who God is. The, the devil himself quoted scriptures to Jesus Christ. So does that mean that because you read your Bible and, and have a memory verse, because you've studied theology all your life, that you're going to get your way into heaven? It's not there. There's more to it than that. You know, but, but Pastor Luke, you know, I, I, I love God. Doesn't that, doesn't that make a difference? I'm here tonight. Can you show me in the Bible where it says that because you have a love for God that you're going to get your way into heaven? You know, some people got on some airplanes, crashed them in the side of the World Trade Center, and right before they did, they said, we love you all. A wrong God, wrong kind of love. Just because you say you love God doesn't mean that you're going to get your way into heaven. There's a little bit more to it than that, and we'll talk about that in a moment. You know, but, but Pastor Luke, you know, I... I I, I, I'm an American. America's a Christian nation. My money says in God we trust. Doesn't that mean, you know, don't Americans go to heaven? Isn't that the whole thing about that? Can you show me where it says in the Bible that because you were born in America, maybe you drive a Chevrolet or a Ford or some other American-made car, you like to eat apple or, or cherry pie or whatever have you, that you're going to get your way in heaven. Can you show me where it says that in the Word of God? Nowhere will you find that, guys. So where do we believe that because we're good? Where do we believe that because we think that we're going to go? Where do we find or where do we get that because we think we know who God is that we're going to get ourselves in heaven? Where, does it, where do we get that from? Because of centuries of belief and of, of, of education from man. But let me tell you something. I'm here to tell you tonight the truth that that's not the way you get to heaven. You know, a man by the name of Nicodemus came to Jesus. And Nicodemus in the book of John in the third chapter asked Jesus, what must I do to get into heaven? Nicodemus in John the third chapter tells us Nicodemus was a Pharisee, a leader of the Jews. So that tells us that Nicodemus had dedicated his life to memorizing the word of God. That Nicodemus was allowed to go to the temple, to the church of his day, and to preach the word of God to those who would hear him. Nicodemus gave to the poor. He did all the right things. He wore all the right clothes. Memorized the scripture. And you would think that Jesus Christ, when Nicodemus says to Jesus, what must I do to get into heaven? That Jesus Christ would say, man, you are on the right path. Keep on going, pat on the back. But he says to Nicodemus, you know what, Nicodemus? You must be born again. Well, what does born again mean? You know, Hollywood, popular culture has made such a mockery out of that term. You think of radical, weirdo, out of control Christianity. But you know what? Let me tell you something. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, born again has always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and you've given God all of your life. Everybody look at me, look at me, look at me. God's not after your mental ascent towards him. He's not after your carnal knowledge of who he is. Clearly we can see that because we know that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know who he is. So clearly there's more to it than that. You must be born again. All of your heart, all of your life. You know, Jesus Christ speaking to the church in the book of Revelation, people like you and I doing works, sitting in, the, sitting in, a, in a congregation together, hearing and reading the scripture, says, I know your works. When I come back, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Whew, harsh words. 
words designed to get your attention. What does he mean? He says, when it comes time for you to meet him face to face, whether you die or whether he comes back, he better find you hot or he better find you cold because if he finds you lukewarm, he will spit you out. He will cast you out, reject you out of the kingdom of God. Well, what does lukewarm mean? Let me tell you what lukewarm means tonight. Lukewarm means in your relationship with God, you're a little bit up, you're a little bit down, you're a little bit in, you're a little bit out. Wishy-washy. Doing some of your own thing, doing some of God's thing. Maybe you got a cross or St. Christopher around your neck. Occasional church attendance, doing your own thing and some of God's thing. I say it like this, you got too much of the world in you to enjoy God. you got too much of God in you to enjoy the world. You're riding the fence. And Jesus Christ says, if that's you, you're deceived in thinking that you're going to get into heaven. I love you enough, I respect you enough, I honor you enough to be up front and to be blunt about it to you so that we can quit playing games and go on with the things of God in our lives. You say, Pastor Luke, I appreciate the effort that you're going through. You find God your way, I'll find God my way. We'll all get there the same. Love wins. Let me tell you something, love won. He sent, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die. A beaten, bloody mess for you and I on a cross so that we could find him. So let's not do it your way. Let's not do it my way. Tonight, if you've never given God all your heart, if you've never given God all your life, if you're not sure, or if you've been living lukewarm, in a moment, let's do it God's way. Jesus Christ said that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except through him. So let's not do it your way. Let's not do it my way. Let's do it God's way. Jesus Christ said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. So here's what I'm going to do in a moment. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, three. Smack my hand on the Bible just like that. And when I do, when I smack my hand on the Bible, bang, just like that. If that's you in this place, if you've never given Jesus Christ all of your heart, you've never given Jesus Christ all of your life, you've ne you're not sure, maybe you thought, man, maybe I did that as a kid, but I don't know if I really did it. Let me say this, deviate from the normal. You know, you've been living life, you said, you know, one day I got saved, I raised my hand, but I've never experienced the joy of the Lord in my life. I want you to question whether or not you really seriously gave your heart and your life to God. Because when you rely on the relationship of God, it's not just an abracadabra prayer, something that you said as a kid, but rather when you give him all of your heart, all of your life. You say, Pastor, look, I've been miserable ever since I came to church, I started coming to church. Maybe in a moment that I'm speaking to you, you want to experience the joy of God in your life in a moment when I smack my hand on the Bible, I want you to pop your hand and say, Pastor Luke, if I put my hand up, somebody's going to see me. I'm going to be embarrassed. You know what? I'm not going to embarrass you. But even if you were embarrassed because you popped your hand up, wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of embarrassment than an eternity in hell? The decision is yours. God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way in. He's not going to make his way in. God has already done everything he can by sending his son, Jesus Christ, to die a beaten, bloody mess, naked, hung on a cross for you and me so that we can pop our hand up and acknowledge Jesus Christ in our heart and our life. So if that's you in this place, if you've never given all your heart and all your life in a moment, I want you to pop your hand up. If you're not sure, in a moment I want you to pop your hand. If you say, you know, I need to get that joy of God in my life, you need to examine your heart tonight. Don't leave this place without making sure that's a gamble on your eternal life that you can't afford to make. If you've never given all your heart, let's do it. If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God, saying running from God instead of to God, when I smack my hand, I want you to put your hand up on the Bible. What you're saying is I want to give God all of my heart. I want to give him all of my life. All across this auditorium, hands getting ready to go up. If that's you in this place, on the count of three. One, two, three. Let me see your hands in this place tonight. I got you. One, two, three. Anybody else in this place tonight? Three, where are you at? Anybody else? Pop your hand up so I can see it. If you got your hand up, let me see it. I got you guys. You can put your hands down. I got you. I got them. Is there somebody else? No, I, I got them. I got you, brother. You can put your hand down. Three wise people, where are you at in this house tonight? You say, is there somebody over there? Four, okay. Family rooms, is anybody in the families? Are we all right in the family rooms? You say, man, uh, I, I'm not sure. Maybe I should do this. Should I do this? Wondering in your heart, you should do this. Pop your hand up so we can go forward with the things of God. Don't leave this place tonight without making sure. If that's you in this place, pop your hand up so I can see it. I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. Where are you at in this place tonight? There's three, four people in this place. Five, I got you. I know there's at least eight in this place. The Spirit of God's telling me in this place that there are some of you in this place that are playing games with God, 
Quit playing games with God tonight and let's move forward for God. Get your act, get your life together tonight. If that's you, pop your hand up so I can see it. Where are you at in this place? Just put your hand up and put it right back down just so I can see it. Where are you at in this place? Five wise people. I see somebody, I see, I got you. Anybody else in this place tonight? God's not going to make you. He's not a manipulator. You've got to choose. You've got to choose. God already chose you. You've got to choose him. That's you. Just go ahead and pop your hand up. I'm taking a long time, but I know that there's people in this place and you need to quit playing games with God. I love you enough. I respect you enough to be in your face and stop playing games with God and let's get serious with God tonight. If that's you in this place, let's move forward. You say, man, I wish this guy would shut up. Maybe that's you in this place. You need to put your hand up. Let's move forward for God tonight. Anybody else in this place tonight? And praise God for five or six wise people. Hallelujah. Here's what I want to do. In a moment, I'm going to ask everybody to stand up. If you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand and you didn't, I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your Bible, your purse, a friend, if you need a friend. I want you to be bold and get out of your chair. You said you were going to give Jesus Christ all of your heart, all of your life. So I want you to be bold. Get out of your chair. Grab your stuff. Grab a friend or somebody next to you and come and meet me down here at the altar. Let us pray with you tonight. So if that's you, let's all stand. If you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, come on down and meet me up here at the altar. You can come. Come on. Get out of your chair. Get out of your seat and come. Come on down. You can come. Come on down. That's you. You can come. You can come. It's not too late. Come on. They're coming, they're still coming. Praise God, praise God. Well, hey guys, today is a new day. Today is the day, the first day of the rest of your lives. I want to do something. I want to introduce a friend of you, of mine to you. This is Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave is like the coolest guy, all right? Pastor Dave was my junior high teacher like 15 years ago. He's the coolest guy, I'll tell you what. He's going to take you right over there. Nothing weird goes on. He's going to pray with you. He's going to give you some free stuff. He's going to invite you to join with us at a program called Spiritual Personal Trainer. Somebody that will help you meet with you before service, help get you strong like a personal trainer did would with your muscles to help you get strong in your spiritual life so you don't go back to the junk and the garbage that you came from. So if you guys would just turn right over there to your left, my right, and go right there with Pastor Dave. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 